Hey everybody, uh, we're going to look at our second little look at the progressives here. Uh, we're in our second little video here to take a look at. Uh, we'll be looking at some things in class as well uh, this week. Uh, include a little look at how Wisconsin is considered a very progressive state as well. Uh, we're going to start with, with the uh, after President Roosevelt leave and the idea of uh, William Howard Taft we'll look at here. And here's Taft. Um, in 1909, President Roosevelt decides not to run for presidency again. He feels that he should only do two terms. He lasted two terms. He took over right very early on first in President McKinley's term, so he decides, I'm going to keep these two-term ideas. Um, a long time ago, George Washington said, well, we're going to serve two terms, and most presidents stick with that. And so it goes to his Secretary of War, this guy right here, William Howard Taft, as his next president. Um, this guy was supposed to be a true progressive, truly make changes in the country. Um, yeah, we'll see. Okay, Honestly, it was actually his first time ever trying to be elected to an office. He always been appointed and stuff otherwise. He ran against William Jennings Bryan, that progressive guy, and he won once again. Little well Taft here. From a rich family, a very rich family, went to, went to Yale College, went to law, and his biggest goal was to become a Supreme Court justice. To be honest with you, we're not really sure he actually wanted to become president. Uh, his big goal was to be a Supreme Court justice, and the cool part about him is that after he leaves the presidency in 1912, he does become a Supreme Court justice and gets, a, and gets appointed to the Supreme Court. So he actually at some point gets his dream. Uh, he, he has a famous, uh, a famous thing of being one of the larger uh, presidents out there, over 330 pounds, give or take. And there is a story about him getting stuck in his bathtub. Supposedly this is actually the tub that was installed, supposedly, but who knows. Um, and believe it or not, he was a very popular politician. Uh, he was the military governor of the Philippines uh, for President Roosevelt, and he was actually really liked by the Filipinos and was actually asked to stay in the Philippines. Um, but his big goal here was to be a trust buster. That's what he was going to be. That's what he was going to do. He was going to stop those trusts just like Roosevelt did. And the minute he walks into office, he takes a law approach to it. He knows the law. He uses the laws. He starts suing different companies for being a trust and opens 85 new cases. Uh, the downside here is that not all those trusts that he has are good trusts. We'll get to that in a second, okay? Um, the new amendments that come out during this time as well. One of the problems the government has is how do we get money for the government, okay? How do you tax, how do you make taxes fair for the people, those kind of deals. And so one of the things that are passed during a tax administration is the 16th Amendment. This idea that you can start taking uh, taxes directly from a paycheck. So I get my paycheck every month, uh, every two weeks, I should say. I have a little part that says federal income tax, and so a, section, a portion of my taxes are taken, of my check is taken away, and that's my contribution to the government. And that was created in uh, 19, well, passed 1909, ratified 1913. They also changed the 17th Amendment too, which was the direct election of senators. Before this, the state legislature, so the guys that we have in Madison here, would choose two people to serve as senator from Wisconsin. They changed this to have the senators elected by the people. Uh, it kind of helps to avoid that whole political machine system of, you know, the, the, where, where a party, where a machine is in charge, and the legislature picking the senators and getting control of Washington as well. And so we have, start seeing these, these changes happen uh, during Taft's presidency. Now, the big problem here is that some of the things that, uh, that, um, that Taft got involved with didn't work out too well, okay? Some of the trusts he attacked were actually ones that Roosevelt thought were good trusts. Roosevelt only focused on the bad trusts, remember? And some of the big trusts were the ones that uh, that Bill Taft attacked, including U.S. Steel. And honestly, Roosevelt dumped him as a friend. He's like, you're supposed to be my buddy. You're supposed to be going to continue on my legacy. You're not doing it. Not cool, man. Uh, not cool. And so we have this idea of the new of uh, Roosevelt dumping Taft, his pan-pick successor being dumped. He also signed something into office called the Payne Aldrich Tariff. Essentially, a tariff bill is about tax on imports, and usually these have been very, very high to help protect the American industries. The, ta the tariffs would raise prices on foreign goods and make people buy American goods and help uh, support those American businesses. Well, it caused lots and lots of arguments in Congress, and actually the tariffs were, tariffs were too high and did do some damage to American businesses. Well, Taft takes the blame for this whole deal, and essentially he alienates everybody. He basically gets everybody angry at him for passing this bill. He comes out and says, this bill is the greatest bill in the world, greatest tariff ever, yada, 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 and basically alienates everybody. Republicans don't like him. Businesses don't like him. People don't like him. And the Republican Party starts to split to conservatives and progressives. And so basically, this whole thing falls apart. It leads up to the election of 1912, and it's a very, very complicated election. One of the first times we have three people involved because we actually see Roosevelt get back in here. Roosevelt jumps in as a third-party candidate. 
and he decides to run as his own party. Now, one as he's uh, stumping or kind of doing his speech, and this is where he gets an assassination attempt in Milwaukee. They actually reenact this every single year. The story goes, uh, Roosevelt's up giving his speech in Milwaukee. Or he's walking in a, in a parade in Milwaukee give his speech. And he was known as a very long speaker. He would talk for, hour, for hours on end, honestly. Uh, the speech he was giving Milwaukee was 50 pages long. He had it folded over in half in his shirt pocket. Well, this guy comes up with a 22 caliber pistol and shoots Roosevelt in the chest. The, the bullet bounces off his glasses case through his speech and embeds in his chest about an inch or so from his heart. Well, Roosevelt gets up there, gives the entire speech to the, to the, to the crowd, blood dripping down his chest, all right? And, and somebody asked him, well, why didn't you go to the hospital? He doesn't go to the hospital at the very end of the speech. And he goes to the, the reporter, takes more than a bullet to kill a bull moose. And hence then, the bull moose party is formed. My favorite party, I mind you, okay? Notice here's a little cartoon showing uh, Teddy here as the bull moose. On the flip side, the Democrats run a guy named Woodrow Wilson. This guy down here, the former president of Princeton University and the governor of New Jersey. Now, he actually had made New Jersey progressive as a Democrat. What's kind of funny is that uh, Wilson got elected by the political machines. He then turned around and destroyed those political machines, uh, improving the uh, political landscape uh, in New Jersey. So who wins? Well, Wilson does win. Here's why. You have Republicans. Some vote for Taft. Some vote for Roosevelt. They split their vote, and Wilson wins because whoever who doesn't vote for Roosevelt or Taft votes for Wilson. And ta-da, Wilson wins. Um, that's a long story short. Wilson's big program is called New Freedom. And here's the big things he does. Number one thing, finish breaking up those trusts. He, he doesn't want to like, just destroy the trusts or destroy the businesses. He wants to create more competition. He try to give more love for the small businessmen. Try to help little businesses out and create bigger competition instead of just being one big monopoly. Try to get more competition. Part of that was also lowering the tariffs so that uh, local businesses had, could um, had compete a little bit more. Sorry about that. Uh, one thing he also created was something called the Clinton, the Clayton Antitrust Act in 1914. It was better than the Sherman Antitrust Act because instead of hurting all organizations, it just attacked the actual businesses. Um, he also passed things that allowed for unionization, allowed for striking, and he started making the first child labor laws, starting to outlaw the idea of child labor. So all these things start coming together during uh, Wilson's presidency. One of the things he does do is create the Federal Reserve, uh, basically a series of 12 banks. You see how they're located here around the country. And these banks were supposed to help control the money supply, basically be a bank for the banks. So this big, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank would help set the interest rates that the banks borrow at, and the banks then lend that money out to the people. Um, it's both it's supposed to provide stability. First off, we're supposed to worry about does the bank have enough money in the bank? Is my money safe? Well, it may be safe, but we always get more if we need to. That's by borrowing from the government. It also helps with borrowing for um, small businesses. If there's more money out there to be lent out to people, then you can uh, lend out to small businesses, get those small businesses growing again, and try to help create that competition that Wilson wanted to create. And so trying to get rid of those trusts, avoid the monopoly by creating the idea of the big, of small businesses. The last big part I want to talk about is the idea of women's rights. And there are a lot of things that were changed in this time. Um, we have been stuck in this kind of gender role for the longest time. And we start seeing those things change in the middle class. More people move to the cities, so it's, uh, families start getting a little bit smaller. Um, you start seeing some things change in the home. Women start getting out of the home doing other things. Um, you know, life, you know, in the home, it starts getting a lot, not let's say easier, but there's some labor and time saving devices. Things like soap. You have to make your own soap anymore. Making soap sucks. Don't do that. You can buy pre made soap. Canned food. You still have to make everything from fresh. Uh, indoor plumbing, vacuum, electric lights, and stoves and ranges, those kind of things. That's just stoves, not stone, stoves. Um, all these things made more, more free time for them, if you will, in the homes that were. Uh, in kind of that homemaker uh, mode. Um, some women did leave the home and start getting jobs, and this became a lot more popular at this time. Uh, educated women went to college, become teachers and nurses, two biggest fields to them there. A women who didn't have a, more of an education could do things like phone operators, uh, clerks, and typists, uh, essentially white-collar work we're talking, 
uh, that they could do in, in terms of the bigger office buildings at the time. There's some still some factory jobs available too. The only exception here is that when a woman still got married, it was expected that she would stop working. Um, you know, it was, you know, as almost all through a time to when my mother got married in the 70s. Uh, that was going on basically the same kind, of, same kind of issue there. So that was kind of expectation. It lasted for a long time there. I one of the ways women got involved too was the creation of the settlement house. We talked about these last unit too, but by women for um, immigrants and women, uh, but usually staff at women as well. So women would hold the classes, kindergartens, preschools, uh, English classes for immigrants, those kind of things. And as we see how big these uh, settlement houses were in the bigger cities, trying to help provide, trying to provide a better life for people in the inner cities. Uh, Jane Adams, obviously, the whole house up here. That's the library of the whole house. A lot of women, a lot of women work there to help provide those things for people. Um, Lillian Wald created what's called the Settle Henry Street Settlement. Uh, this is that, that example of that down here. Um, and we'll know more of those from our project we're doing in class. Uh, the other big movement here was called the suffrage movement. And it was basically the idea of uh, the right to vote. It's one of the biggest ideas that women had was the idea of the right to vote. We'll talk about this in class on Thursday. But um, we start seeing this idea change. It'd been, it'd been, you know, people have been talking about this since the 1840s. Should women have the right to vote? They should have the right to vote. 1890, we see the uh, National American Women's Suffrage Association get formed, uh, led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and they kind of started pushing this movement. They're pushing this movement forward. Excuse me. They're pushing this movement forward a little bit, and so we started seeing uh, different forms of protest to the idea of women have the right to vote. We started seeing uh, marches, especially nonviolent protests. Um, in Britain, this movement was definitely a more violent movement in Britain with hunger strikes, that kind of stuff. It was a little more on the side of nonviolence in the states. Um, and here's some examples, some pictures here where you see different uh, different things. Often to open up the marches, the speeches, those kind of things women did in order to try and get the right to vote. And so you see some examples of that held here. And some states, a few states are allowing women's suffrage. Uh, Montana, out west, one of the first states to allow uh, women's suffrage. It was really a huge change. And so it gets among all the people, among all the states, to see if we can have women's suffrage. And eventually it does happen in 1920 with the passing of the 18th Amendment, uh, it should be 19th Amendment, it should be 19th Amendment, pardon, it should be 19th Amendment on my slide here, uh, that we see women given the right to vote. Now, one question is where did progressivism not work out so well? And there are two or two areas where you see it not work out. First off is the idea of race and segregation. There is still segregation this time, it is still a big deal, and actually it gets worse before it gets better in the United States. Um, race is still a big issue, okay? African Americans, you know, they're not ads, that kind of stuff is still very much based around the Euro-American culture. Also, the idea of eugenics becomes popular this time. Try and make a better life. Um, basically, the idea, kind of that whole idea of, you know, social Darwin comes out here again, that people's lot in life, their status is based on where they start, um, and their features depend on how intelligent they are, how good they are, those kind of deals. And it's a pseudoscience. People have thought you'd actually measure noses and measure eyes and and heads and that kind of stuff and figure out how intelligent you are, how good you're, how good a person you're going to be. And this becomes a very popular idea, uh, throughout the early 1920s and eventually actually will lead to, uh, the causes of the Holocaust later on in Germany. So something like interesting comes out of there. So that's where we're going to stop for this today as we're talking about this in class, uh, this week. These are due on Wednesday and we'll get into a little bit of things with this along with the Wisconsin progressivism on Wednesday. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, please make sure you've done, done for Wednesday. See you then.